Germany in Europe and Japan in Asia sign a pact against communism. In his Berlin office, Herr von Ribbentrop, German ambassador to Britain, who is signatory and spokesman for his country, stresses the common antagonism of Germany and Japan to the doctrines and activities of the Communist International, without, however, identifying the latter with Russia. Germany and Japan, who are not prepared to tolerate these activities any further, have now taken action. And while the Japanese representative adds his comments, it's proper to reflect what significance attaches to this new lineup in the world's affairs, grouping Germany, Italy, and Japan in the same bloc. the most popular arrival of all. To a world balancing on the brink of chaos, Mr. Chamberlain stands as the savior of peace, and in this character he is hailed even in German hearts. For his unswerving purpose, the peace of Europe, the British Premier goes straight to the Führer House where the fateful conference is to take place. He walks up the steps with von Ribbentrop deep in thought. Flick is arrested. By contrast, Hitler leaps from his car and after acknowledging the salutes, mounts to the door at an eager pace. 
record for the waiting world and for posterity the scenes of deliberation. There is no large, long table with chairman and rules of procedure. These leaders of mankind stand around discussing the problems which affect the destiny of all humanity with the informality and directness reminiscent of a school study. So well are they known to you that I may be excused from identifying the principles in these historic pictures, but look at this shot in which you see the statesmen all together, Mussolini, Hitler, Deladier, and the camera pans over to Mr. Chamberlain on the right. It is two o'clock in the morning, and agreement has been reached. Hitler signed. Then the signature of the prime mover in the negotiations, the prime minister, goes on to the document, while Mussolini and Hitler remain in earnest conversation. The Duce takes the pen and dashes off his autograph across each of four copies. And finally, Mr. Deladier adds his name and the endorsement of France. Agreement has been sealed. Peace is what is to thank others. This morning, I had another talk with the German Chancellor, Herr Hitler. And here is the paper which bears his name upon it as well as mine. Both the President and Mrs. Roosevelt would talk a lot about what went on. He would say, Every time one gives in to Hitler, his ambitions become greater and he wants more. And I think the president felt that in the end, uh, a war was unavoidable. But Roosevelt's hands had been tied by Congress and a cautious public. Desperate to do something, Roosevelt broadcast a personal appeal to Hitler, asking him to halt further aggression. In reply, Hitler ridiculed the powerless president with withering sarcasm. Herr Roosevelt verlangt endlich die Bereitwilligkeit, ihm die Zusicherung zu geben, dass die deutschen Streitkräfte das Staatsgebiet folgender unabhängiger Nationen nicht angreifen und er nennt Finnland, Lettland, Litauen, Estland, Norwegen, Schweden, Dänemark, Niederlande, Belgien, Großbritannien, Irland, Frankreich, Portugal, Spanien, die Schweiz, Liechtenstein, Luxemburg, Polen, Ungarn, Rumänien, Jugoslawien, Russland, Bulgarien, Türkei, Irak, Arabien, Syrien, Palästina, Ägypten. In essence, he was being told by Hitler, you're not a player in this world political game.
Finally, the day came. Like a good murder mystery, no one had guessed how it would happen. Molotov and von Ribbentrop got together, and the Nazis and communists signed a pact. It was a betrayal by the communists, and the world was plunged into war. Historic Brenner Pass, that gateway through the Alps by which most Teutonic invaders have entered Italy, was chosen as the meeting place for the dictators. The weather was a little chilly perhaps, but the importance of the occasion no doubt made up for that. Ribbentrop and Count Ciano follow their leaders, but were not always present for the conversations. Probably the Führer had some secret and confidential things to tell the Duce, but whatever was said, they apparently parted good friends. Anyway, everyone saluted everyone else in quite the correct manner when Hitler departed. Mussolini made an impressive march to his own train. And the last picture is more saluting. From Finland comes the story of the evacuation following upon the peace. Camice nere della rivoluzione e delle legioni, uomini e donne d'Italia, dell'impero e del regno da Maria, ascoltate! Un'ora segnata dal destino il cielo della nostra patria. L'ora, l'ora delle decisioni irrevocabili. La dichiarazione di guerra è già stata consegnata agli ambasciatori. ambasciatori di Gran Bretagna e di Francia. Scendiamo in campo! contro le democrazie plutocratiche e reazionarie dell'Occidente e 
in ogni tempo hanno ostacolato la marcia e spesso insidiato l'esistenza medesima del popolo italiano. Italia proletaria e fascista è per la terza volta in piedi forte, fiera e compatta come non mai. La parola d'ordine è una sola. Categorica e impegnativa per tutti. Essa già trasvola ed accende i cuori dalle Alpi all'Oceano Indiano. Vincere! un lungo periodo di pace con la giustizia all'Italia, all'Europa, al mondo. Popolo italiano, corri alle armi! No regresso a Berlin, il Führer fu salutato pelo povo durante la viagem con dimostrazioni di carino e di gratidão. A cidade de Berlim prepara, entretanto, uma recepção inolvidável. As ruas da estação até à chancelaria do Reich transformaram-se em verdadeiros tapetes de flores.
Never before since Jamestown and Plymouth Rock has our American civilization been in such danger as now. For on September 27, 1940, this year, by an agreement signed in Berlin, three powerful nations, two in Europe and one in Asia, joined themselves together in the threat that if the United States of America interfered with or blocked the expansion program of these three nations, a program aimed at world control, they would unite in ultimate action against the United States. The Nazi masters of Germany have made it clear that they intend not only to dominate all life and thought in their own country, but also to enslave the whole of Europe, and then to use the resources of Europe to dominate the rest of the world. We must be the great arsenal of democracy. For us, this is an emergency as serious as war itself. We must apply ourselves to our task with the same resolution, the same sense of urgency, the same spirit of patriotism and sacrifice as we would show were we at war. We have furnished the British great material support, and we will furnish far more in the future. There will be no bottlenecks in our determination to aid Great Britain. No dictator, no combination of dictators will weaken that determination by threats of how they will construe that determination. The British have received invaluable military support from the heroic Greek army and from the forces of all the governments in exile. Their strength is growing. It is the strength of men and women who value their freedom more highly than they value their lives. I believe that the Axis powers are not going to win this war. I base that belief on the latest and best of information. We have no excuse for defeatism. We have every good reason for hope. Hope for peace, yes, and hope for the defense of our civilization and for the building of a better civilization in the future. I have the profound conviction that the American people are now determined to put forth a mightier effort than they have ever yet made to increase our production of all the implements of defense, to meet the threat to our democratic faith. As President of the United States, I call for that national effort. I call for it in the name of this nation which we love and honor and which we are privileged and proud to serve. I call upon our people with absolute confidence that our common cause will greatly succeed. In den Straßen Berlins drängen sich Hunderttausende, um dem japanischen Außenminister einen herzlichen Empfang zu bereiten. Die geschmückte Vorhalle des Anhalter Bahnhofs. Der Minister des Auswärtigen von Ribbentrop begrüßt den hohen Gast auf dem Bahnsteig.
Neben dem Minister Generalfeldmarschall Keitel, der Chef des Oberkommandos der Wehrmacht, der japanische Botschafter in Berlin, General Oshima, und Berlins Gauleiter, Reichsminister Dr. Goebbels. zum Schloss Bellevue, dem Gästehaus der Reichsregierung. Formation der Leibstandarte Adolf Hitler erweist die militärischen Ehrenbezeugungen.
Führer empfängt den japanischen Außenminister zu einer längeren Aussprache. Die Besprechung über die schwebenden politischen Probleme verlief im Geiste der herzlichen Freundschaft, die Deutschland und Japan verbindet. unoccupied France come these further pictures of the tragedy in this Nazi starved area. The word has gone round that an American Red Cross Mercy cargo of food has arrived, bringing relief to the stricken people of a country stripped of everything by its enemies. Germany has brought France to the brink of famine. In hundreds of schools, innocent victims receive their quota of soup. Thousands of children, knowing the horror of hungry days, are given vitamin pills to foster resistance to starvation. In this world of pact making and pact breaking, Stalin and the Japanese Foreign Minister Matsuoka look on as Commissar Molotov puts the Soviet seal to a five-year pact of non-aggression. It's just a little difficult to know who is friends with who these days, but as Monsieur Matsuoka signs for Japan, it's comforting to think that when one country invades another, they don't have to worry about declaring war. However, it's always as well to see eye to eye, for a while at any rate. Getting the wind up in...